Our Fraser Coast dinghy cruising group is heading out on our second journey. This time we're heading across from Riverheads to the west coast of Fraser Island. We're planning to head up to Mackenzie Jetty, which was the site of the Z Special Forces Commando Training Group during the Second World War. Pete was the first one to untie his lines and head out, together with Liz, his friend from Sydney. I have my wife Denise sailing with me today, and life's uh, also in a mirror, and he's sailing on his own. For a while we all kept head to head, and then as the land breeze started to ease from the west, we found that um, there wasn't quite enough wind to sail, so we started the engine and we had a little bit of a motor sail. We ended up about a mile or so ahead of the, of the other two boats. So we sat there because it was pretty flat and decided to make a cup of tea for Denise and a coffee for myself. Once I had the little Trangia spirit stove set up, I lit it and let it sit there to warm for a little while and turn around to grab some water. There must have been a, a little set of swell came across the bay, probably from a passing cruiser earlier in the day and it caused Moonlight to pitch and roll a little bit. It knocked a water container off which struck me in the shoulder and I knocked the Trangia stove off the thwart onto the floor. In the process uh, of trying to catch it, I managed to throw most of the working parts of the Trangia over the side. Can't even remember doing that. But uh, grabbed the fire extinguisher and to the uh, accompaniment of two pretty significant white mushroom clouds, managed to put the fire out fairly quickly. But in the process, I uh, managed to burn my foot. So I slung my foot over the side and dragged along in the water, which brought some relief. And gradually the other guys caught up to us and they were of course quite interested in what the mushroom cloud was all about. They'd assumed that I had some kind of uh, major engine failure but I think my foot dangling over the side probably gave more of the story away. We continued on our way towards the west coast of Fraser and in that area there's a bit of a coral reef that extends south from Woody Island. Uh, the water there is probably a metre or less deep and it's not that well marked. So we sort of went around in circles for a little while, um, steering away from the shallow sections until the Fraser Island Ferry came past showing us where the channel was. So we backtracked a little bit and then followed the path of the ferry along a dog leg heading north. The wind had sort of swung round to the south by then and so we had a downwind run and we were assisted by a two knot current. And pretty soon we were able to swing around to the east and we had a beam reach into shore landing at Mackenzie Jetty. Moonlight is a heavy boat for a size and this time around we had her full, filled to the gunnels with camping gear. We used to travel with far less in our youth but nowadays the camp chairs, the table and the mattress are mandatory items, especially the mattress. We arrived at the shores of Fraser near Mackenzie Jetty in the early afternoon on the high tide. Lowering the sails on moonlight takes a little bit of extra care over a modern masthead rig. It can give you a serious clunk on the head if you're not careful, which is probably why some sailors prefer bamboo. Just 50 yards north of our camp, the remains of Mackenzie Jetty stand Stonehenge-like and the darkened timber is a stark contrast to the silica sands of Fraser Island. The fact that so much of the structure remains today is testimony to the durability of the timber used. Much of the Suez Canal was lined with Fraser, Fraser Island satinae. Our interest in Mackenzie Jetty had its roots in its military history. The area was used for jungle training by the Z Special Forces, an Australian commando unit during World War II. 
There are quite a few relics of the period that remain scattered throughout the high dunes. In preparation for climbing up into the dunes to explore the old commando camp, Denise washed and dressed my foot with some antiseptic cream. The medical kit that we had proved to be totally inadequate and I've resolved to get some decent gear together for the next trip. Peter lent me his fluorescent yellow neoprene boots which turned out to be the height of fashion but worked really well to keep the sand out. And up here on top of the dunes is the remains of the um, commando school used by Z Force for uh, specialist training which was used to uh, raid Singapore in 1943 and again in 1945 um, and my dad was in the commandos at that time and he wanted to volunteer to train here and in the interview they asked him if he'd like to rescue his brother who was in Changi at uh, Singapore and he said of course I would and so he was immediately refused uh, entry into the program which was just as well because the second time they went to, phrase, uh, to, to Singapore Operation Remau they were all captured and beheaded by the Japanese just a few months before the end of the war. Pete's dad was accepted into the commandos at the age of 16. They didn't expect him to pass the training, but when he did, they held off to his 17 before he was allowed to serve. Pete's dad went off to New Guinea, where he was involved in covert operations against the Japanese. You just gotta love those high vis neoprene boots, Chris. Back down on the beach, some of the rusting relics like this tractor, half buried in the sand, belong to the timber era. And in the distance, you can see a boiler that used to run the sawmill. tides were not coming up as high as they normally do, right to the base of the dunes. That left a little strip of soft white sand that we were able to scrape out to get a level area and that's where we pitched our tents for the night. We hadn't been sitting there for long and a lone dingo came along sniffing the air and hoping that he could come back later in the evening after we'd all gone to bed to see if there's any scraps left behind. of Fraser Island pretty much own, uh, mind their own business. It's very important if they do approach you that you've got to show them who's boss. It's not a bad idea to carry a stick and usually if they see a stick in your hand they know to stay clear. Once again Pete's little 8 inch high brazier created the warmth and atmosphere that we needed in the camp. And as predicted in the morning, there was plenty of evidence to show that he'd been checking out the campsite overnight. We'd been very careful not to leave any scraps around, by the way. Overnight, my foot had swollen up a fair bit, and I didn't really want to get it in the mud, so I had the privilege of sitting in a camp chair with my foot up on another one, and watching everybody else cart and carry all that heavy gear back down loaded into the boat. We started our sail back in about 10 knots, which pretty soon built to 15 in the gusts. Looking back up towards the top of the mast, you could see how the top yard flexes to leeward and spills huge billows of wind in the stronger peaks. When I went forward to let down the main, 
Denise was at the helm and we were hit by a stronger than usual gust which made us heal quite a bit. Little boats like this don't generally capsize, she's very stable, but what they do is they take in huge gulps of water aft of the shrouds. Soon I was lining up a small space between two groups of fishermen at the marina. They love to poke stick at people when it turns pear shaped, but this time I timed everything just right and I stepped off in a graceful movement in what was a perfect park. <laughs> 